The exhibit is called Scenes of Transcendent Beauty, Thomas Moran's Yellowstone. And I'm Jane Lavino, the Curator of Education here at the museum. And be, uh, I just want to mention the exhibit, we're letting you see it now, but it officially opens tomorrow, the 14th, and it will remain up, tell me if I've got this right, Tammy, through August 21st. 23rd. Oh, it's going to end partway through the week? Yeah, okay. well, we had to do a little bit of schedule okay. shifting. So you have, you have the summer months, <laughs> yes, anyway, yes. to enjoy this. Most exhibit. of August. Great. <laughs> I want to mention we have some very generous sponsors, some of whom perhaps are with us today. They are Howell and Ann Breedlove Charitable Foundation, Thomas and Elizabeth Granger Family Charitable Fund, Carol Hummel, Carol and Jim Linton, Long Reimer Winnegar, Ann and Michael Moran, Bill Newton, Maggie and Dick Scarlett Endowment in honor of Bill and Jaffa Kerr, Charlotte Stifel and the Wyoming Cultural Trust Fund. The exhibit that you're about to enjoy oh, okay. starts right here where we are standing and it spans throughout this Changing Visions Gallery. Another new exhibit is going on in the other space, which um, you'll have to come back and see later. But the entire exhibit fits into this space. Uh, our speaker today is Dr. Tammy Hannawalt. She is our curator of art who put together this exhibit with other members of our curatorial team and in collaboration with the Yellowstone Heritage and Research Center just outside of uh, Mammoth Hot Springs. Tammy will give us an overview of the exhibit, which includes work from our permanent collection, works on loan, and also a few works, uh, permanent collection works on loan, oh, and then of course the Yellowstone Heritage and Center that I mentioned earlier. A few, uh, let's see, follow, oh, uh, this is important. Following the sneak peek program today, the Palette Restaurant off of our main lobby um, will offer a generous 10% discount if you identify yourself as a sneak peek program attendee, if you can remember to say that. Yeah. <laughs> but um, we're glad you're here today. Thanks for coming. And I'm going to turn it over to Tammy. Thanks, Jane. Welcome, everyone. Um, I hope this exhibit, not that it's just about um, Moran, but about um, when we talk about uh, the United States and land and how we think about land, um, I'd like to start out by opening with an acknowledgement. Every community owes its existence and vitality to generations from around the world who contributed to their hopes, dreams, and energy to make the history that led to this moment. Some were brought here against their will, some were drawn to leave distant homes in hope of a better life. And some have lived on this land for generations longer than land for more generations that, that can be counted. Truth and acknowledgement are critical to building mutual respect and connection across barriers of heritage and difference. We begin with this effort to acknowledge what has been buried by honoring the truth. We are in Jackson. Wyoming on the ancestral lands of the Eastern Shoshone. We acknowledge the Northern Arapaho, Bannock, Blackfeet, Absoluka, Cheyenne, Grovant, Kiowa, Nez Pierce, and Ute tribes who also have historic ties to this area. Also all the others. We pay respects to their elders past and present and please take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us here today. So in 19, or 1872, Yellowstone was made into the first national park in the world. And I didn't know it was in the world when I first started the, working on this show, so I thought that was pretty impressive. Largely due, uh, this uh, making these lands protected was largely due to the efforts of Thomas Moran and um, uh, Hayden, who um, started an expedition into Yellowstone. Before 1871, when Hayden took his, um, Ferdinand Hayden took his expedition into Yellowstone, Yellowstone was kind of a fantasy. And um, in this corner, we have some ex explanatory text about what Yellowstone, people thought Yellowstone was. So I'm sure a lot of you have heard of John Coulter. 
Lots of things in Yellowstone are named after Coulter. He was kind of a, a little bit of a traveler. He was with the, um, the Lewis and Clark expedition, and he parted off from them, went into Yellowstone, and he saw all these things. He ended up in the hospital after he got out of Yellowstone, but um, he brought back these stories about geysers and boiling springs and just things that sounded impossible. So a group of um, Montanans, of uh, some of the um, people who were in the government in Montana, about nine of them, decided to get a group together and go into Yellowstone and see if Coulter's hell was a real thing. That's what people nicknamed it after John Coulter told these stories. Uh, well, they saw for themselves that there were geysers and there were bubbling springs and the ground steamed and um, all these beautiful areas and scenery. Um, one of the people, his name was Nathan Lanford. He um, wrote an article for Scribner's Magazine. And if you look on these uh, panels right here, you'll see that there are some uh, etchings that were in the magazine article from 1871 called The Wonders of Yellowstone. You can look it up online. And those drawings were done by Thomas Moran. Thomas Moran had never been to Yellowstone. If you look at them closely, they're kind of a little weird, but he uh, was going off of what he was told, and there was another person, Charles uh, Moore, who was in the party that drew some sketches, kind of gave him an idea. So Thomas Moran, uh, illustrator for Scribner, said, I want to go to this place. Hayden started the expedition, and he said, well, I have a painter. That painter couldn't go with him. Uh, well, I'm going to ask Albert Bierstadt. Well, Albert Bierstadt couldn't go with him either. So lucky for Moran, who had done some work for Jay Cook, the railroad financier, um, Jay Cook said, you got to see this guy, Thomas Moran. He'll do a great job for you. I'm going to loan him $500, and, and Scribner's going to loan him $500. Moran didn't think to ask that he could be sponsored, but um, <laughs> he went on this trip with about $1,000, joined up with Hayden's expedition in uh, Yellowstone. And if you look at that painting right there, that is done by William Henry Jackson, the photographer who took this picture of Thomas Moran at the uh, terraces in the, in the up by Mount. But Tom, uh, William Henry Jackson was already the photographer for the expedition. Um, when Thomas Moran came to the expedition, he weighed 110 pounds. He'd never shot a gun. He'd never rode a horse. And he said he'd never camped under the stars, but uh, he must have camped at Lake Superior when he was working on that. We have his pistol that he was given, his revolver. Uh, a hat, I don't know if that hat was on the expedition, but I thought it was kind of nice to have his hat in the expedition. But look at that gun. Um, I know uh, our registrar, Emily, held it, and she said, this is really heavy. And I can't imagine somebody, a little person like Thomas Moran, carrying that around all the, all the time with him. But um, on this wall, we have all of the watercolor sketches that he or not all of the watercolor sketches, but a good segment, 20 of the watercolor sketches he worked on when he was out in the field in Yellowstone. So these are, you know, he's not embellishing these. These are what he's seeing. This is where he's taking his notes. So I think these are really special. Thankfully, the Yellowstone Heritage and Research Center was able to loan these to us. Um, we have some, uh, different scenes. This is near Fort Ellis. So this is one of the first images you saw of Yellowstone. And the next thing they came to was the hot springs and pools up near Mammoth. Surprisingly, there were some people camping out for arthritic. And they were using the pools to ease their arthritis pain. Um, and um, actually, in one of the um, paintings that you'll see around the corner here, there's also been a, like a fence by the falls, which is interesting. So there were people, there are obviously some people visiting the place, 
before the Hayden expedition came in. But Hayden um, advertised it as this was unexplored territory that this group was going into. Um, the springs were one of the highlights of the, of the um, expedition. They spent some time there, and Thomas Moran got a lot of um, things from Gardner River, things I'm sure you're familiar with seeing. Um, and these are what he's seen for the first time. There are some notes, too, on, written on, handwritten on some of the, of the pieces. Um, a couple, we have two of the sketches came from 1892 because he took another trip with Jackson later on and uh, got some more sketches for some more artwork. Thomas Moran was really taken through with Yellowstone. His first visit really made an impression on him. It changed his career entirely. So you can see that um, why he kept coming back to it. And in fact, after it was uh, approved by Congress, the Yellowstone would be a protected area. He called himself Thomas Yellowstone, right? Yeah. So if you go through these sketches, you'll see that he's got some of the most beautiful scenery. This one right here of double slide, if any of you have been by that, maybe on the river or been up to that area. Um, you can see that the double slide is in the background here. He's got a lot of details about the ge uh, geographical or geological areas and the flora and the fauna. He's sort of helping the scientists out too, and he's getting his color and his color palettes in. I remember Tucker telling me, you have to get the paint is what's going to tell you what the colors are in the landscapes. And I'll never forget that Tucker, that was it. <laughs> but that's what he's doing. He's getting the information down, and he's going to use this for his other paintings. This is his notes. So this is the sketch that he did before he saw Yellowstone. And the devil's slide kind of looks like the Great Wall of China here. Um, it looks quite a bit more manufactured than the natural um, area it is. This one was really interesting. We got it on the wall, and I'd only seen these in Gardner, and then... Um, you know, the pictures that they had, that they had given us for checking, and I'm writing the labels. Put it up on the wall, and I noticed there's something drawn in the front here. <laughs> Eight snakes. <laughs> Which is a little creepy, and I think I'd better put another label up here to say, can you see any wildlife in this, in this painting? But he's got eight snakes crawling around in the Cinnabar Mountain of the Yellowstone River. Um, and I thought that was really uh, sort of a unique thing that he drew in there. So they must have been there. The biggest thing that they ex uh, the expedition was so impressed by was the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone. So this entire wall here is different areas in the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone. Um, they have sand in the canyon, canyon walls. Uh, they spent a lot of time here. And you know, um, and Jane and I were talking about this this morning, too. But you know how um, the rocks in Yellowstone have sort of that, there is sort of that almost white rock? And Thomas Moran is painting on top of this, this white, with the reflection of the sun, I'm sure. And it almost looks, it looks like to me, almost like there's a, almost a layer of snow. But he's just trying to get that sunlit, beautiful shimmer in the canyon. And he's trying to remember that. He couldn't remember everything, though. So he had to have some help from William Henry Jackson's photography to really get the details of the landscape in. All of these sketches, he had, um, I think there were 150 of them that went to Congress with Jackson's photographs and with the Hayden um, the reports from the, the scientists and the other people. There was a sketch artist too, just a sketch artist that went with the, the with the expedition. So all this went to Congress, and this this convinced them to um, have Yellowstone as the first national uh, first national park. Um, 
which is really interesting because they could see it. They could see it now and they could see it firsthand. This was um, the colors, the beauty of the landscape. They could really picture it. When most people from the East had never seen this, anything like this. Thomas Moran took all his sketches back after he got back. Before they, in the, in the time they weren't with Congress, he used those and the photography from William Henry Jackson. This is a reproduction of a painting that is 12 feet long and 8 feet high. He did it in two months. He was so excited about the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone. Uh, this painting sold to Congress in 1872 for $10,000 which is a pretty good amount in 1872. I don't know what that translates into today's money. But um, this painting is now being displayed at the uh, Department of Interior Museum. I asked them if they wanted to loan it to us and they laughed at me. <laughs> so I said, well, do you have a high resolution picture? Let's put it up. So a smaller version of a very large painting that you can see at the uh, Department of Interior Museum. And I did go to Washington in December and take a look at it. Across from this one, there is the Chasm of the Colorado, which is of the Grand Canyon. Thomas Moran was the first painter to see the Grand Canyon of Arizona from the Colorado River, from the bottom looking up. So he was on the expedition with William, no, it's Powell's and Kristen William. Anyway, he's on the Powell expedition for that one. So that was after this one. This painting has a lot of subtle hints in it um, that scholars have looked at. Um, for our purposes, wildlife is an important thing. There is a raptor, a bird of some sort. And I'd let you find them, but I'm just going to point them out. There's a fell deer. Um, Thomas Moran in his diary talks about um, a native person hunting deer, and there, and I gotta move this, but <laughs> there's a bear <laughs> right in that corner there. Um, and it's really fun, if you, if you happen to be in Washington, D.C. area this summer, the Department of Interior Museum finally opened again. It's a small space, and you have to go to the Department of Interior. And on one wall they have this painting, and directly across from that they have the Chasm of the Colorado. And it's pretty amazing to see those two pieces together and in all their grandeur. Um, um, Thomas Moran also took a little bit of artistic license in this painting. As any of us know who have been to this area, um, this isn't exactly how it looks. He kind of collaged together different parts of um, different parts of geographic features and different things. He's got some people in here too. Right here, this looks to be, um, most people, most scholars have talked about that this is probably Hayden. Next to Hayden is a Native American person. Kind of a mystery. We can tell it's a Native American person because of if they're dressed differently and they have, it looks like to be some sort of feather headdress on, a small one. Um, and I'm going to talk more about that, but I wanted to say that in the 1870s, Thomas Moran had a big decade. Um, these prints are from 1874, 75, and he did some in 76. They're all included in a folio called the Yellowstone National Park in the Mountain Regions, portions of Idaho, Nevada, Colorado, and Utah. So this is after he's been on the expedition to, um, on the Powell expedition as well. He kept very busy, but these have some great um, scenes from Yellowstone of some of the most um, well-known spots in Yellowstone. This is Castle Geyser, and then um, different parts of the canyon and um, other parts of Yellowstone, the falls, and things like that. So these are also very old, but um, they're prints. They're chromolithographs. And this painting, we are fortunate enough to loan from the Gilcrease. And this is also of the terraces. If you look close, there's three little people 
and a fourth person. I think the first person on the three is Thomas Rand because he was said to have worn a red flannel shirt. This person has a red something on. The person in front, another Native American. Um, nobody really knows who this Native person was. They never talked about having a guy. Um, Thomas Moran, or I'm sorry, Hayden was afraid of being attacked by Native people in the park. There's a lot of different Native people who had migration routes through the park, of course. And on this wall, over here, William Henry Jackson took a photo of Inez Pierce encampment, um, and he took other photos of Native people that were in the area. This summer, um, Yellowstone is working with 27 different tribes who they have identified as, as having uh, migration routes through the park, and uh, they are going to set up informational areas and uh, provide information, the story backgrounds of their, of their individual tribes. So that will be something to look for if you go to Yellowstone this summer. These are some of the personal effects of Thomas Moran that he had, and I always think these are really cool to see. He had a flask, important work for being out on an expedition. He had sketchbooks, um, and so these are other sketchbooks that are not quite so finished, but that he used for information. He also did some etchings, and uh, his glasses, of course, paint brushes, and the diary. Um, his diary entries are not all that interesting, pretty business-like, sketching at the falls again. Um, but uh, you can look at his diary, sorry, <laughs> you can look at his diary and uh, make out some of the words here. If you want to go on the Yellowstone Heritage and Research Center page, you can see the diary transcribed. But this is his handwriting right here. We decided that it, the diary is a little too fragile to open it up and leave it open, so I had to leave it closed, the back cover's off, and the spine is really brittle. But um, I think it's nice to have the piece here, and then you can get the information there. Thomas Moran, um, he also inspired some other artists, obviously, but um, he never made it to Jackson, Wyoming. Isn't that weird? Because he's got a mountain named after him here. Um, <laughs> he made it to the Idaho side. Um, these are some another piece we have on the from the Gilcrease in Tulsa. I like this one a lot because it's really look close. And again, I love that he hides things. He doesn't hide them, but he draws little clues. There's an entire orchestra out in the field here with cattle. I think he's got a sense of humor too. But you can see, yeah, it looks really close, but there's a cello and they've got uh, sheet music and things like that. And I'm just imagining how cool it would be <laughs> to have an entire orchestra at the base of the Tetons in this uh, brilliantly lit um, landscape. <laughs> Thomas Moran was also inspired by a lot of landscape artists and it is associated with the Hudson River School uh, artists um, for his paintings of the West. This painting is called The Eternal Snows of Mount Moran, and we received this as a gift. This is part of our permanent collection now, our first Moran paper. And um, again here, a lot of people have asked me, where do you think this is? And I said, I don't know that it's any place in particular. I don't know if he walked up to maybe where the glaciers were on that side of the Tetons, on the Idaho side. Um, but again, he liked to use license for drama, and uh, it's a beautiful painting. His wife, Mary, was also an artist, which I don't think too many people know. This drawing of Thomas Moran looking very serious and wearing a smoking jacket and a, a <coughs> little pillbox kind of hat, um, was, uh, she did, and I think it's pretty interesting that um, she was often praised for her art. She was more of a print artist and an etcher, um, and she got a lot of acclaim for that. She also, I believe, did some work on Yosemite and has some artworks on Yosemite. But uh, since our um, other 
summer exhibit is the women's artists, uh, celebrating women artists in our collection, I think it's important that we notice that Mary Moran, too, was an artist. And then these are all from our collection, too. Lindsay Scott did this beautiful painting of the lower, uh, Yellowstone Falls. And there are some raptor birds up here, osprey, I think. Um, so Thomas Moran's legacy living through other artists this one's an older one too, who uh, this Thomas Hill would have been painted in the same time Thomas Moran was painting. This one done by an artist not so well known, uh, August Becker from Germany. So he must have come here, maybe. Uh, <laughs> and if you look, these buffalo are kind of sweet, except one has its mouth open and it's showing its teeth. He didn't <laughs> quite have a handle. I'm getting them from the front, but I think it's a very interesting painting and it brings up ideas about conservation and what Yellowstone has gone through. Um, it was down to like something like 23 bison in, in Yellowstone and there were still poachers trying to get those bison. Now we have uh, over 5,000 bison in Yellowstone. So, um, I think that is about the end of the overview of the Thomas Moran. Um, please stay and enjoy. Questions. And questions. questions for Tammy? Tammy. Yeah. Is there a map that shows you how they came into Yellowstone, where they came in, and where they came in? I don't have one uh, exhibit, but, um, and I, I never came across one that showed exactly their, their trail. Thomas Moran left the expedition before they came down to Jackson. 